Almighty God, the words we've sung are true. Your faithfulness is overwhelming. All day, every day. God, I thank you that you are the anchor. You and you alone are the solid ground and you love us with a merciful and grace-giving love that, that defies understanding. And God, I know many in this place, many of us have experienced decades of your faithfulness and we could give bold testimony of your, your miraculous provision, your your care, your mercy, your compassion. And yet, Lord, we, all of us, we live in, in, in a dynamic life that, uh, that's one day at a time. It's always present tense. And, and each day and each new year presents more opportunities to trust you yet again. More challenges, more painful experiences where we have to seek your intervention, we have to seek your care, we have to seek your, your healing touch. And God, I know our faith will continually be tested, and yet you will continue to be found faithful. And so God, in this hour, I, I ask that you would just capture our attention, teach us, reveal yourself to us. Awaken us in a fresh way this morning to your overwhelming love and faithfulness for us. Lord, I thank you for Ella. I thank you for her testimony that she belongs to you. She wants to follow you. She has followed you faithfully in obedience this morning with her baptism and with her as a, an example for all of us, God. May we be the people who walk out of here today with a fresh commitment to moment by moment, day by day, faith, trust, and obedience. So thank you, God, that you're working all of that for your glory and our good right here, right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you. Well, I'm super excited for us this morning to study together. And I want to ask you to find a Bible and turn to Psalm 55. Uh, very excited to dig into God's Word together today. Um, very excited for us to read through the entire Bible together starting in a week and a half. And as Cameron pointed out in the announcement time, there's about 25% of the different 20-minute increments still to be claimed. Uh, so you have an opportunity to join in that chain of reading from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. It's a rich time. I've never stood here. We stand here and we on this table, we read it out loud. You know, wherever the person before you ends, when your 20-minute shift starts, that's where you start. And I've never, it, it's an amazing thing to experience. I've never read the Bible in 20 minutes, a uh, 20-minute reading, where I didn't feel spoken to, uh, taught, convicted, inspired, where God wasn't uh, saying something not just interesting, but something personal. And so I encourage you, and yes, we, like always, every year it's harder to get the, the late night shift slots filled, but if anybody's got that adventurous spirit and you don't mind being up here in the middle of the night, it'd be great to do that. Um, so anyway, I encourage you to take those shifts that are still remaining and uh, enjoy that. The, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it penetrates down to the soul and spirit joints and marrow. It, it transforms us. It's a miraculous intersection with God speaking to us as we open up and read his word together. So I'm, I'm super excited about it, that. And somebody over the next week and a half will read Psalm 55. But today we're all going to read it. So if you've got Psalm 55, I'm very excited for us to learn uh, from this together this morning. I'm not usually, one of my th things, I'm not usually very good at coming up with real creative titles for messages. That's not a big emphasis of mine. Today is like an extreme example of my lack of skill. And so today's title is just three really big lessons, three huge lessons. And that's what we're going to get out of these verses today. And I hope that you'll pay close attention to it. Uh, the first one is this. And I hope these will be impactful for you. We need to make our desperation work for us. And so what we're going to encounter is David in desperate straits as he um, writes this poem from the depth of his heart. So read, follow with me if you would. I'm going to read the first five verses. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Just follow in whatever translation you've got. 
The heading for Psalm 55 says, for the choir director on stringed instruments, a mascal of David. We're not exactly sure, but relatively sure. We know what events in his life prompted this poem, this song. Uh, extreme circumstances. If you want to go back and read them, I'll have them on the screen in just a second so you can write them down. But it's 2 Samuel. It's recorded in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 17 when he is, uh, when his own son, uh, Absalom, has risen up against him in rebellion, leading a rebellion against him, which included many of his long, previously trusted, and previously loyal uh, friends who were um, rebelling against him trying to kill him. So it's, it's extreme in the, uh, in the extreme. So here we go. Let, first five verses. <clears throat> David says, give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Give heed to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I am surely distracted. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I believe that that's a pretty good... um, little example of what somebody might pray who's in desperate straits. He is feeling the sense of desperation. And I know there's varying degrees, there's varying you know, types of desperation that you and I might experience. Um, but I think we all universally experience it in some form or some fashion. S- some causes of our, our feeling of desperation are external, external primarily. They come at us from the outside. Circumstances arise against us. It could be relational circumstances. It could be uh, health circumstances. It could be financial circumstances. It could be a combination of all of the above, right? Social circumstances. The world's just caving in on us. And we see David expressing that. Look down in verse 3. He says he he experienced it obviously externally because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked. They bring down trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. Whatever those external pressure points are or those overwhelming forces of opposition or challenge that are crushing us beneath it, they always produce an internal sense of hopelessness and despair. By the way, the word despair or the root of desperation is two Latin words, which means to lose hope. And it's this feeling you get when you can't see a way out, when you can't see the sunrise, when you can't see that there is going to be a better day. And the most extreme form is that feeling goes, you know what, I don't even know that life is worth living. Maybe the world will be better off without me or something in that direction. So we know what it's like to feel like, I got nothing. There's no chance. Everything I had hoped for is now dashed. Everything I expected has turned up disappointing. Or maybe it's this compilation, the continuous kind of dog pile of event after event after event. We all know what despair feels like. And David expresses it in verses 4 and 5. So his were external circumstances that caused him internally to feel the way he describes in verses 4 and 5. My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. You ever been there? Yeah. You know what it's like to be on your knees just crushed in a puddle of your own tears. We all do or we all will. In fact, these circumstances, you go, you read that passage in 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 17, you look at what David was going through and you go, oh, wow. 
His own son Absalom led a rebellion against him, and not only did he have to flee for his life, they're coming to kill him, they had to flee from his own home, his own palace, he had to flee from his city, his capital city, Jerusalem, and those that are with him, helping him escape. As as they flee and they head out of Jerusalem down toward the Red Sea, down toward the wilderness, it tells us that there's a guy, like they're on one ridge kind of going down, there's a little valley, and then up on the other ridge, there's a guy basically walking along, mocking and taunting and shaming public. David. In essence, parading before any who will listen all of the wrongdoings, all of his sins on display for everybody, and some valid, some slanderous. A couple of David's followers go, you want us to go over and kill that guy? David said, no, just let him pile on. Just let him pile on. I deserve it. So David writes this and that. But this is lesson number one, brothers and sisters. When we're in that season or whatever the circumstances are that have caused us to feel like, oh man, I've lost hope. Whatever those circumstances are, here's what I want us to understand in the lesson number one. We've got to make that time. We've got to make that season work for us. We've got to make it work for us. And it works for us by doing what David is modeling, by seeking God. And we we see this. He's not... He's not checking out. He's not running away. He's not turning to something else. This is, what he, this is a desperate plea in verses 1 and 2. He says, give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Give heed to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I'm surely distracted. Listen, those prayers where you are on your knees, broken to the bone in a puddle of your own tears, those can be the sweetest, most powerful, and richest prayers you ever pray. So when we are that broken, when we are feeling it, brothers and sisters, let's make it work for us. And we make it work for us by crying out to God, doing what David did. God, I got to have you. And it's an interesting thing. Maybe everybody, I'll take the maybe out. Everybody I've ever known who's had a very tight, intimate, close walk with Jesus, the the kind of person who walks so closely with Jesus that you can't help but notice it, and and they're defined by a a shalom, a a spiritual kind of level of peace, just that's how they walk, that's how they experience life. They've got a a confidence, they've got an unshakability, kind of like we've sung about. Their feet are on the solid rock. They, They walk with Jesus on a level that most Christians don't yet or don't ever. When I've met those people and known those people, always they're people who at some point have been greatly broken. There have been people who know what the crumbled puddle of tear moments are. They know the prayer David's praying right now. They know what it's like to say, God, I got nothing. God, I got no prospects. God, I got no hope. God, I see no light. This is God, I got nothing but you. And and the way David is kind of phrasing it, their hearts know what it's like to cry out with that kind of desperation. Like, oh, God, you listen, I mean, David's like, give ear to my prayer, oh God. Don't hide yourself from my supplication. Please, God, please. If you don't intervene here, I got nothing. Please. Give heed to me, as he says in verse 2. Answer me. I'm restless in my complaint, and I'm surely distracted. Like, I, I can... I can barely stay focused on seeking you because I'm so torn up over this. I'm eaten up, chewed up and spit out by these circumstances. And so if you're there, seek God. Just say, God, all right, have your way, have your way, have your way. And I know this to be the case. Of the, we could bring probably a dozen people up here this morning seated here who have experienced those times. And, and they would probably affirm, no, I know, not probably, they would affirm that the desperate prayers are the best prayers. And, and though there's nothing in us that necessarily would ever want to go back to those moments where we feel that way, now that we've come through them, we wouldn't trade them for anything. And people would come up and testify and they'd say, yeah, you're, you're right, the sweetest, best, most fruitful prayers I ever prayed were just those desperate prayers. When I was desperate. Oh, make the desperation work for you. I remember several years ago, there was a a group of South Korean missionaries who were in Iraq and they got captured by terrorists and held 
for ransom for a while. I think one or two of them actually were executed in the whole course of the process. It was, it was dramatic and extreme. And then after they were released and returned back to South Korea, one of the, uh, a while later, one of the, I think it was one of the pastors out of the group said, you know, I wouldn't go back there. I don't want to go back to being held captive. But I long for the sweetness and intimacy with Jesus that I felt while there, basically in my most desperate moment. The desperate prayers can be the most powerful prayers. So if you're there or when you're there, make it work for you. You cry out and you keep crying out. You seek him and you keep seeking him and he's working something. And he will do what we've sung about already. He will prove faithful. And you'll see. But you follow David's example. David's modeling for us. And and here's a reality I want us to understand. Unfortunately, here's how we work. And that's why I've never met a person who walks very powerfully and intimately with Jesus who hasn't been broken greatly. It's because unfortunately, we don't tend to learn life's biggest, sweetest, deepest lessons apart from the hard way, right? Right? Unfortunately for us, we most often make the needed changes or we, we, we become most open to God's work in us. We become most teachable. We become most moldable. We become most receptive and repentant when we have to because we find ourselves in a desperate position, right? That's, that's how we work. We can confess it. Something about our hard-hearted, hard-headed nature, right? Any of us that really learn the deepest lessons often have to learn them the hard way. We have to almost go to the school of hard knocks. To make those needed changes in our lives, we we most often do it because we're forced to, not because we can see that we need to. But I want to just take a chance, and for the one person who's here, maybe, maybe there's a lot of us, who might be willing to be teachable and put themselves on the potter's wheel and let him mold us, to, to, to be receptive, to be repentant, to, to be broken without having to go through breaking circumstances. In case there's somebody willing to learn life's deepest lessons and be moldable, teachable, changeable without having to be broken into it, I, I want to just ask the question this morning, how do we, how could we, how could we cultivate a desperate heart even when we're not in desperate circumstances? Wouldn't that be great? I kind of, I, I, I'm going to make an analogy out of my own experience for this. When I was in college and played football, and I was a backup quarterback, I was a bench warmer, I hated it, it stinks, being the bench warmer, being the backup stinks. But one lesson I had to learn and learned a little bit, uh, tried to learn, in being a backup quarterback is you have to learn from the starter's experience. You have to. Or, or you, you're not making any progress at all. See, what happens in football practice during the week leading up to the game on Saturday is the offense, the, 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 they're practicing the plays. And they run them over and over and over in the course of the week, and they want to get every little bit of the execution just right so that hopefully they have a chance for success on Saturday. And so what, what happens is the starting quarterback, out of all the plays, all the times you run a play to practice during the week, the starting quarterback runs about 70% of them. So that player, he's getting all the actual experience. His body's actually going through all the motions and the movements and learning how to do it. The backup or the backup, second string, third string, they get a few plays during the week. They get to try it, you know, get in there and run that play, practice maybe five, six, ten times over the course of the week. But if in the game all of a sudden something happens to the starter, he gets hurt and the backup has to go in, guess what? The coach isn't sitting there with a pickup truck full of excuses ready to just give you a break. The expectation is, even though you didn't get to physically with your body run through all the lessons and receive the instructions and the corrections during the course of the week, you better have been paying attention in all of the, we call them reps, all of the opportunity, all the practice plays, all the reps that the starter got, they have to somehow, you have to figure out how to make what they were learning by running those reps, you have to make them count for you. Because if you get your chance to go in, there's no excuses. You better perform, you better know what you're doing. Here's your chance. You better know. So, so you have to learn as a backup, like, i got to watch that guy and make whatever it is he's experiencing physically and whatever lessons he's going through, i got to make those lessons apply to my body and my execution and my work. I, th- his lessons have to apply to me, even though I didn't go through it. Anyway, it, it's quite a significant skill if you would embrace it. 
My suggestion is this is the best skill to apply toward the hard knock lessons most of us require about what, how would your heart be? How was your heart if you've been through this? How would your heart be when you're on your knees in a puddle of your own tears? How open are you? How teachable are you? How desperate do you need God and His intervention? Well, couldn't we learn from those moments maybe that we've experienced in the past? Or couldn't we learn from others as they're experiencing that, the universal testimony that they give? Couldn't we make what they learned by physically going through it applicable to ourselves? And couldn't we apply it right now, every day? Couldn't we wake up every morning and offer the same kind of prayers from the same spirit and the same heart? that we would offer in desperate circumstances, even if and when we're not in desperate circumstances. Wouldn't that be brilliant? So how do we do that? Let me give you the answer. It's not complex. It's very basic. We just need to remember and believe that we are completely desperate. We are. Listen, we need to remember this because the truth is we are completely needy for God every moment of every day, not just on the day we got fired, not just on the day we got broken up with, not just on the day we got betrayed, not just on the day that the diagnosis got delivered, but on every day, even the day we got promoted, even the day that the the year-end bonus was bigger than we thought, even on the day we got great news, even when the grades came back and I did better than I thought, even when I got invited to a party, I thought those people would never invite me, whatever. Even on my best day, the reality is I'm completely needy for God. So we need to remember that, and we need to believe it so that we do on our knees in regularity, in desperation, even on the best day, the same thing with the same spirit, the same heart we would when we're being crushed, right? Right? Remember and believe that you are completely dependent. In fact, Jesus says this in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I know there's a spiritual and spiritual fruitful, fruit-bearing uh, application and meaning to what he's saying, but I think the, the meaning extends universally to everything. Guess how many of us in this room have anything to do with making our heart beat one more time? We got nothing to do with it. You cannot make it beat. You can't make your lungs do what God's programmed into your body to do involuntarily. You can't make it keep going. Apart from God and God's grace, you got nothing. We got nothing. We have no breath. We have no life. We have no intelligence or intellect. We have no physical capacity. We have no earning capacity. We have no celebration capacity. We are 100% dependent and needy. Truth is, even though it's a little bit kind of hidden from us on our celebration days, right, we are in a desperate position. We are desperately needy every day. By God's grace, we only feel it dramatically on really terrible days. Paul writes, oh, where am I? Paul writes in Colossians 1, the God Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Look, if Jesus decided to take his sovereign, merciful hand off of the universe, I, I, we wouldn't, it wouldn't stick together for a second. It would disintegrate and dissolve. I believe that's absolutely true. In James, he tells us why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. You got no control. I love it. I mean, these are good practices for us to say, hey, what do you hope for in the new year? Or, you know, what are you, what are you setting as a goal? What are you going to work on? How are you going to change some things to honor God better in the new year? Those are great, but nobody's promised not only another year, but much less tomorrow. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. None of us do. And he says, what is your life? You're just a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's good to remember that and believe that. Then we can pray the prayers of a desperate person like we should even when we're not in desperate circumstances, okay? In fact, this, this making our desperation work for us is so powerful and so significant. Uh, the lyrics to a couple of uh, old songs that really have been significant to me and my understanding in my life, one was from a, a guy named Steve Green years ago called Hidden Valleys. 
If you've heard this song, I love this song. It's about, actually, it's about King David and his experience. And a hidden valley, hidden means it's just between that person and God. You know, it's not like on public display. In a valley, obviously, this is a downtime. And he says, hidden valleys produce a life song. Hidden valleys make a heart strong. Desperation can cause you to sing. In David's case, hidden valleys turn shepherds to kings. Talking about what David went through as the shepherd boy out in the fields where nobody was looking and having to fight off the bear and the lion and trust God. and make, We've got to make our desperation work for us, brothers and sisters. Ideally, even in times when we're not in desperate circumstances. There's another song I love um, by Laura Story called Blessings. Uh, powerful. She says in there, what if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst the world can't satisfy. I love that. And part of those broken moments, what, what it does is it, <clears throat> it opens you to really understand and embrace that greater thirst. What I'm really looking for, what I'm really desperate for is God. And that's a powerful thing when everything else but God is stripped away. You go, ah, the glory in it is now I just found the one thing I was actually needing and and deeply most wanting anyway all along and didn't know it. Now I know it. And then to be able to keep cultivating that desperate thirst, even when the streams of abundance are flowing. This is what we're after, brothers and sisters. She goes on to say, and what if the trials of this life, the rain, the storms, and the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise? And many here have found out that they are. But she says, and all the while you hear each desperate plea. I love that. And you long that we'd have the faith to believe. You keep seeking him. You keep taking your desperate plea to him. It's glorious as much as even more than it is painful. And this is what David's doing. He keeps taking his desperate plea to God. Second lesson, brothers and sisters, is we have to go through it. We have to go through it. Notice verses um, 6 through 8. David, after he voices this great sense of desperation like he's lost hope, verse 6, he now expresses, I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness I would hasten to my place of refuge from the stormy wind and tempest. He's voicing that that sensation that we all understand and feel when we're in desperate straits. Just, I just got to, I want relief. I want to escape. Get me out of this. He's saying, I wish I had wings like a dove. I'd fly away. I'd go somewhere. And he's he's saying that what what he really wants is, is real rest and peace. Look at the end of verse 6. He's, at least in the New American Standard, it says, I would fly away and be at rest. But we need to understand what's really going on in the depths of our psyche, our hearts, minds, and souls, is a desire for real rest. What the Bible calls in the Hebrew language shalom. This deep, unshakable sense of peace, this soul-level well-being where we know we're protected, we know we're guarded, we know we're good, we're whole, we're complete by what God has made us. The temptation when we're in desperate straits is to substitute what God wants to ultimately bring for something that appears to be a shortcut that can only offer temporary relief, not real rest. So brothers and sisters, David's voicing it. Good. Let's, let's be honest. David's very honest. Look, I, I just, oh, I need some form of escape, but we cannot settle for substituting temporary relief, numbness, or some other form of sedation for what God wants to give. And I, I've had this kind of awareness in my walk with the Lord from even just young age going through stuff, even stuff in school. I think even I remember some things in middle school, high school, college, facing something daunting that I didn't want to face. It was going to be hard. It was going to be difficult. It could be something as simple as a, a difficult conversation with a professor, a difficult conversation with a friend, or some painful thing I was going to have to go through. 
And I remember praying prayers like, please, God, give me like a bypass around this, right? You know, can we just kind of, can we make me not have to deal with this? Can you take it away Whew, miraculously or something? And I remember over and over, just as strong as anything I've, I've experienced in my walk with God through the years, just a, a confirmation as if God said, no, you got to go through it. I lo- and God said, I love you too much not to require you to go through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How else are we going to know he's with me? How else are we going to be able to sing about his faithfulness from the heart like we did this morning? We've got to go through it, brothers and sisters. That's the only path to real rest and peace. All the other little versions of quote-unquote escape, they're not, they don't provide real rest. In fact, they actually in the long run make it worse. We all feel the gravitational pull of the temptation to run away, to quit, quit trying, check out, go passive, go silent whatever that form of escape is, just withdraw, shut down, let somebody else take it, abdicate what God's called me to do or given me the responsibility to do. So brothers and sisters, we've got to resist, reject the temptation to just try to escape, want to escape. In fact, so much so we reject it that we don't even entertain or dwell on escapist thoughts. You don't even have to look hard for escapist thoughts when you're down, do you? They seem to come rushing toward you. What if I went there? What if I, what if I quit? What if I got somebody else? What if I... Don't entertain them for a second. Reject them. And run to God instead. So we see David voicing this, but notice where he ends up going. And this is our model. Look down in verse 16 through 19. He says, As for me, I shall call upon God and the Lord will save me. What a powerful statement of faith given where he was in desperate straits, being absolutely crushed. He described it as being overwhelmed by, you know, the horrors of death have overwhelmed me. And yet he's able to say, I'm going to keep seeking God. I'm going to keep going after God. And I know God's got a way out of this. I know God's going to see me through this. And he goes through it goes through the pain. He goes, he goes through the pain with perseverance and patience. God, in this whole scenario, 2 Samuel uh, 15 to 17, God doesn't bail him out of it quick. He's not over it in a hurry. It's a process that he's got to stick with. But he says, here's how it's going to go. I'm gonna, as for me, I'm going to call upon God. The Lord will save me. Notice verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur and he will hear my voice. I'm going to go to him and I'm not going to stop going to him and I'm going to keep going to him and I'm going to be persistent and patient and I'm not going to let up until. This has always been the way of people that know and walk with God. When they're in their most desperate straits, you go all the way back to Jacob when God turns his name from Jacob to Israel. It's after a whole night of wrestling with God and his his thing was, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so we keep going after God. We keep pouring out our complaint. We keep praying like David prayed in verses one and two. And I'm going to, he says, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming. Verse 18, it says, he will redeem my soul in peace. From the battle which is against me, for they are many who strive with me, and God will hear and answer my prayers. The one who sits enthroned from of old. He's confident, he's been through it, he knows, and he knows the path, he's modeling it for us. So, brothers and sisters, this is the way we have to go. In the dark of the night, it only seems like the sun won't rise. It will. You keep going after God. You keep running to Him through the pain with perseverance and patience. Third lesson for the morning. We have to remember that people are people. What I mean by that is we need to have the right expectations with everybody in our lives. We've got to manage our expectations. This is even our spouses, our closest friends, our loved ones, everyone. Everyone, every human we interact with is human, and we need to remember that. In fact, this is the source of David's great anguish, verses 12 through 14. Notice what he says, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide myself from him. 
But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend. We who had sweet fellowship together walked in the house of God, walked in the house of God in the throng. It's like, whoa. This was a human being that I would have said previously was loyal to, we, were, had, a, we had a loyalty to each other. We, we were close friends. In his case, it's somebody within his own family. Listen, we have to remember that when we place our hope, because remember, desperation is when we lose hope. When we place our hope, the full scale of what our souls really long for, when we place that in a person, any person, any group of people, that is misplaced hope. That is misplaced hope. Because here's the reality we all need, we all want, we all long for someone. Go with me on this. If you're writing these down, write them down. I believe every single one of these is 100% true. That we all need someone. The longing of our heart is to find someone who's completely, let's go down the list, completely reliable. They're never going to fail us. They're never going to let us down. We long for that. We long for somebody who's completely faithful, true to their word, true to the relationship, true to the commitments. You you know they'll never waver, they'll never back out, completely loyal. Many of you, this is the source of your desperation. It was someone who you thought was loyal. And then that's what betrayal is, right? We, we know the pain of that. Someone who's completely trustworthy. We're looking for someone who's completely accepting. Isn't that what our souls are longing? Somebody that accepts me for who I am with all my junk. I'm accepted anyway. We're looking for somebody who's completely loving, including compassionate and kind. This is what our hearts long for. We're looking for somebody who's pure-hearted, who you can trust their motives is what I mean. You know, somebody who, boy, you legitimately know that they always have your best interest in mind. That's why they're kind, right? We long for that. And we have this thing in our human relationships, even the best of them, that, ah, you know, maybe they're just kind of doing that because they have to out of obligation or, I don't know. But what if what we really long for, somebody pure-hearted and finally just somebody that's completely available. They're always there. Here's the deal. There's not one human or one group of humans that fits the bill. So to the extent that we put our hope for having those needs met in somebody, it's misplaced hope. We have to remember that. David's, let David take the rep for us on this one, right? Let David learn the hard lesson. He's like, oh man, this was people I went to worship with. This is the people that were my friends, my closest friends, are now hunting me down. Okay. Let's not have to experience it ourselves. Let's be receptive and teachable. Here's the takeaway. The legitimate need and desire and longing in each of us, this legitimate need, can only be met by one, one source, one person, one friend. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. There's one, you'd go down the list, everything from available to loyal to pure-hearted to to loving. There's one to loyal. It's Jesus. In a few moments, we're going to take the bread and the juice that represents his ultimate commitment on display to you and to me. He gave his life for you and me. 100% completely reliable, trustworthy, loyal, loving. He and he alone is the one. So the lesson from David, remember people are people. The scriptures say that one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. There's one friend, and it's talking about Jesus, ultimately. It's also talking about unreliable friends. Do you know who's unreliable friend? Everybody. Do you ever feel that? Like, don't you get down on yourself like, oh, man, I'm such a bad friend. Right? Everybody's had that feeling, right? Especially like Christmas and New Year. Ah, it kind of reminds us of people and ah, didn't get Christmas cards to them. I I didn't even give them a token to tell them I'm thinking about them. I didn't even, I haven't called them in a long time to check on them. Ah, I'm such a bad friend. 
you're right, you're a terrible friend. <laughs> you might be a great, you're a great friend, humanly speaking. But none of us can be the friend that each soul around us needs. But there's one. There's one who is. Only one, right? And David's demonstrating how to turn to him, how to seek him, how to go after him. So that's what we do, brothers and sisters. We remember, put the right expectations on the people around us, and then we pursue this active, real, every moment friendship and companionship that Jesus gives. That's it. What, what do I mean by that? Listen, I, I mean this legit straight up, that, that the best friend you have with no close rival is Jesus. Actively, every moment, every day, you're like, well, wait a minute, Jesus, I don't see him. No, that's okay. That, just because you don't see him physically doesn't mean it's not real. He's more real than what you see physically or touch physically. Any friend you could go spend the afternoon with, that's what I'm talking about. Build that friendship with Jesus. This growing ever awareness of his constant presence, the camaraderie, the companionship, the dependence on him, the, the engagement with him, the, the receiving from him, the yielding to him, the conversing with him, and the, the trusting him, and the talking to him. Practice the presence because he's always with you. Build the friendship, the only friendship that will meet the deepest needs. Work with, this is our quest, brothers and sisters to live in an active relationship, friendship with Jesus. Then, what do we do with all these people around us? <laughs> then, out of that relationship with Jesus, we've got our deep needs met. We don't not have to try to get it from anybody else, right, who can't give it the way we need it. Now we're free with the love with which Jesus has loved us to let it flow through us to others. And even people that might be not very loyal, we can still love them. Even people that aren't as kind, love them. Even people that let us down or are not as available as we wish they were, just love them. We're free. Every need my soul has has been fully met, can only be met by one friend. Out of that vibrant relationship, I can enter into all the other relationships, eh, just, I'm just here to love, even my enemies, okay? You don't like me? It's okay. I'm going to love you. There we go. This is where God's taken us today. And as we come to finish the year with communion uh, this morning, let it be a, an expression of our devotion, our worship, our gratitude, and also our aspiration for the new year. That Jesus, here's who you are. Here's what you've done for me. And man, as I thank you for what you've done for me, as I thank you for loving me like no other can, God, let this drive my focus on you in the days and year ahead, okay? Guys, let's come. Worship team, come on. Let's get ready for uh, taking communion. Those who are going to um, distribute the elements, you guys come, get ready. Just be ready. In just a moment, I'll, I'll say let's distribute the elements. Let me just set it up quickly. What we do is, as Mark led off the service, it's one of the two ordinances that the Scriptures give the church to, to regularly engage in together in our worship together, baptism and communion. In communion, this is a symbolic representation of God's sacrifice for us, of Jesus' love for us. And so with that, the main thing is that this is consistent with your life. So as we pass the elements out here in just a minute, if you have not put your faith in Jesus yet, uh, or you know you haven't, or you're not sure if you have or not, let the elements just go by. Just don't, don't participate in it. We don't want anyone to participate hypocritically. If the physical taking in of the elements that represent the body and blood of Jesus, if you haven't actually spiritually taken in Jesus, then, then don't go through the physical representation of it. So just let it go by. Um, but for those that have... Boy, this is a, a, a glorious God-given opportunity for us to connect with Him, to worship Him, to offer ourselves to Him as He has sacrificed and offered Himself to us. Let me pray, and then we'll pass these out. And I'd ask you to just hold it. We're going to have some singing a little bit, and then we'll all partake together. God, thank You. 
Thank you for your unspeakable love. Thank you for your overwhelming compassion and power. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for the covenant in your blood. Thank you for your broken body. God, thank you for your love. Lord, tune our hearts even now in this moment to worship, to seek, to long for, even to long for you desperately. God, I thank you that you're doing that in Jesus' name. Amen.